It's the top secret network of government sites, the confidential series of heavily guarded facilities dotted around the United States where entrance is impossible without high level security clearance. No, we're not talking about Area 51 or things like that, nor are we talking about biosafety level 4 labs like Fort Detrick, which houses stockpiles of nasty stuff like Ebola. No, rather we're talking about an entirely different sort of stockpile, one that seems to be on the face of it, a bit absurd, but also one that the federal government deems absolutely critical to national security. And that would be America's secret stockpile of chickens. Right now, in places like Pennsylvania, hundreds of thousands of chickens are being fertilized around the clock by lucky roosters, all with the goal of laying uncountable numbers of suitable eggs. But these eggs aren't destined for delighting commuters in egg McMuffins, no, no, no. Instead, they are reserved for research centers run by some of the world's biggest pharmaceutical companies. Centers where they will have a single, highly specific goal to fulfill. The goal of helping the United States government save the world. You can almost imagine the disappointment a foreign spy might feel breaking into these facilities after first locating the anonymous buildings scattered throughout much of Dutch country in Pennsylvania, buildings whose locations are known by only a handful of officials. Our spy would run a gauntlet of challenges, avoiding armed guards, vaulting over high fences. Once inside, he'd have to change into a spare hazmat suit to blend in, break the encryption on keypads to make his way through bomb-proof doors. It would be an adventure worthy of Fox Mulder. Almost. Because once our forlorn spy finally did it, finally penetrated to the heart of this secret black site, he wouldn't find some nefarious government project or hidden evidence of extraterrestrials. Oh no, what he would find would be lots and lots of chickens. Well, chickens plus a large, large number of eggs. And presumably a bunch of extremely happy roosters sauntering around and mating with all the sexy poultry around them. Beyond that, we can't really say. Details are sketchy, and everything about the insides of these facilities is classified from the number of chickens to the breed of hen used. Even visitors that have a good reason to be there must be accompanied at all times by minders. Those who work on the site are told not to let their friends know what they are doing. And a reason? While these shadowy farms aren't just rearing chickens for food or in the hopes of crossbreeding them with aliens or something like that, instead they lie at the very heart of Washington's plans to save us all from the next pandemic. If you're anything like we were when we started researching today's video, you're probably now thinking something along the lines of, <laughs> wait, what? Chickens? Pandemics? It's a big leap, Simon. Come on, fill me in, mate. But it turns out that in the case of a deadly flu pandemic, a vast stockpile of chickens is exactly what you need. That's because the most common types of flu vaccine are developed inside hen eggs. If bird flu does decide to one-up COVID and make the leap to humans, it will be from giant government farms like this that our salvation eventually comes. Now, we'll be getting a bit deeper into the science around making vaccines from eggs in a couple of chapters' time. But first, though, let's get to know these secret farms a little better, starting with the most obvious question of all, where the heck did they come from? And to answer that, we need to jump in our handy TARDIS and travel back in time to a year that won't exactly be heading many historians' lists of greatest years of all time. That would be 2001. That fall, America was hit by the double whammy of 9-11, followed by a spate of anthrax mailings that killed just five people but put the entire nation on edge. Then, just as this heightened fear of deadly diseases was cranking everyone's anxiety right on up, bird flu came along and, well, turned it all the way up to 11. That year, avian flu began sweeping through bird populations, looking for all the world like it might soon jump to humans and cause the first major pandemic in decades. When the government tried to check just how prepared the US was, well, they got a bit of a nasty shock. There was a single licensed flu vaccine producer in the United States. Worse, they had nowhere near enough chickens available to ramp up production at short notice. If 2001 was indeed the year of the next great pandemic, America would be stuck relying on the goodwill of foreign nations to manufacture and ship the vaccine. And look, thankfully, as you already know, 2001 was a whole 19 years too early for a pandemic. The 
bird flu scare came and it went. But the crucial lesson did remain. If the US wanted to insulate itself from the next Spanish flu, it would need to step up its vaccine production capabilities. And that meant spending millions of taxpayer dollars on securing giant flocks of chickens. Although the flu scare came in 2001, it would take the government a few years before they started taking the project seriously. It was only in 2005 that selected barns were given a designation of critical national infrastructure, turning them into the top secret sites that they are today. It was also around this time that a lot of the hygiene protocols came into place, stuff like making employees wear hazmat suits and forcing everyone to disinfect their feet and the wheels of any visiting vehicle, stuff designed to avoid anyone bringing in a pathogen that might kill off the flocks. But the real change came in 2006 with the creation of BARDA. Standing for Biomedical Advanced Research and Development Authority, BARDA didn't just take over control of the egg project from the Department of Health and Human Services, it also ensured a market incentive would always be in place for those making flu vaccines. In the US, you see, most of this development is done by pharmaceutical companies like GlaxoSmithKline or Sanofi. Companies that, you know, need to make a profit. This is great when you want vaccines developed for things that recur in predictable cycles, like seasonal flu, but less so when you want them for unforeseeable events, like a uh, gigantic pandemic. It just costs companies too much to keep everything constantly in place for a huge outbreak that may not arrive for, well, God knows how long. What BARDA does in part is to act as a guaranteed buyer of unused doses. That ensures the egg farms and pharmaceutical companies are incentivized to keep production constantly at higher capacity than is really necessary. This, in turn, means that when a flu pandemic does strike, scientists don't have to waste the first few months desperately trying to source millions of chickens. The downside, of course, is that this preparedness does not come cheap. Since the exact figures are classified, no one knows how much has really been spent on America's chicken stockpile. But a 2010 Wall Street Journal investigation claimed $44 million had been spent since 2005, and closer to our time, a 2017 Government Accountability Office report highlighted a $42 million three-year contract with just one chicken supplier. And that's just one of them. There are many. Overall, it seems quite likely the program is in the hundreds of millions. The counterpoint is that a full-blown pandemic would be orders of magnitude more expensive. Like comparing a child's cheeky fart to the eruption of Kraken Tower. Seasonal flu, for example, costs the US over $10 billion each year from hospitalizations, treatment, lost workdays, and so on. The COVID-19 pandemic was estimated in 2022 to have already cost America $16 trillion. So yeah, compared to those figures, paying to house a bunch of chickens long term doesn't exactly seem that bad. And if it's any comfort, it seems like those chickens have pretty decent lives. The Wall Street Journal investigation also reported on conditions in the farms and revealed just how tightly controlled everything is. The birds get a special diet, carefully monitored to stop them having too much salt, as this can affect laying patterns. The temperature is kept at a steady, pleasant level, and light levels don't change across the year, so there won't be any seasonal variations. Oh, and they also have plenty of sex. Unlike the eggs that you eat each morning, eggs used for vaccines have to be fertilized, meaning plenty of poultry hanky-panky at all hours of the day. In fact, the only real downside seems to be the short lifespan. After nine months, chickens stop laying optimal eggs. At that moment, the farms step in and euthanize them. But perhaps it's time now to stop examining these facilities in the present day and turn to the past to answer what is presumably a burning question that you all must have. Namely, who decided to start making flu vaccines from eggs in the first place? Considering how important they are today, chicken eggs entered the flu story pretty late in the game. The name influenza itself dates back to the 15th century, when a mysterious illness in Italy was blamed on the influence of the stars. A poetic, old-timey way of saying, we have no idea what's going on or what's causing this. Oh, it must be the Lord. Yeah, Old Testament God. It wasn't until the following century that flu as we know it really made its way into the historical record, because the 16th century has the distinction of playing host to the first known flu pandemic. Interestingly, there's some arguments about when it happens. There's a 1557 pandemic that seems to be influenza, but modern scholars think it was actually a different disease. Regardless, 
Everyone agrees that the one that struck in 1580 was the real deal. At lightning speed, the flu spread across the known world. Untold numbers died, including 8,000 in Rome alone. After that, sporadic, horrifying flu outbreaks became just one of the things that humanity had to deal with. Between 1580 and 1890, somewhere between six and eight influenza pandemics clobbered humanity. But it would be the first pandemic of the 20th century that finally kick-started progress on a vaccine, a pandemic that also has the distinction of being one of the worst natural disasters to ever befall humanity. We're talking of course, about the Spanish flu. In 1918 and 1919, Spanish flu tore through the world like a vengeful chicken tearing through Colonel Sanders. Between 21 million and 100 million people died. Over a third of the planet's population was infected. Still, there was one upside to all this death. It was the 1918 pandemic that finally made doctors realize that flu was not caused by bacteria, but by a virus. And knowing what caused it meant, oh, we could start trying to cure it. It was a long road to the vaccine, far longer than the year or so it took us all to get our COVID shots. It wasn't until 1933 that English scientists at the Medical Research Council finally isolated the influenza A virus. But it was what came two years later that was the real breakthrough. That year, an Australian with the magnificent name Sir Frank McFarlane Burnett uh, discovered uh, you could take that isolated virus and grow it inside of hen's eggs. That meant you could isolate neutralized antibodies, which in turn meant that you could take a decent crack at making a vaccine. The first flu vaccine doses were administered in 1937, shot into the arms of British soldiers. Just a year later, Jonas Edward Salk led the first trial in the US military. It was the birth of the modern flu vaccine. By the 1940s, governments were administering shots to the general public before winter each year. Of course, though, you can't just infect an egg, suck out the white into some gigantic needle, and then shoot it into the arms of patients. That would be both completely useless and highly dangerous, and it would also certainly lead to a malpractice lawsuit. No, no, no. The proper way to make vaccines from eggs is far more complex and, well, also far more interesting. Although it will eventually end with a whole bunch of secret chickens laying a whole bunch of closely guarded eggs, the process to create a flu vaccine begins far away from any farm. Each year, the World Health Organization gets in touch with places like the US Centers for Disease Control and the European Medicines Agency to discuss what kind of vaccines they're going to make. And the reason for this is that the flu mutates so quickly that you can't just produce a single vaccine, call it quits, and then clock off for a little bit of golf. No. Instead, everyone has to work together to identify worrying strains and then send samples to vaccine makers. It's at this point that our feathered friends come in. Armed with hundreds of thousands of eggs shipped in from across the nation, pharmaceutical companies begin the process of growing the chosen virus strains. In a 2020 interview with NPR's Planet Money, one of the guys involved explained how it all worked. The eggs are placed on a giant conveyor, which carries them beneath a bunch of automated needles, which quickly drop down and inject flu virus inside them. The hole is then sealed, and the eggs are placed in an incubator for around 10 days. This step is vital, because it's what allows the virus to grow and start replicating, mimicking what it would do inside a human. Once the incubation period is over, it's back on the conveyor for an encounter with a series of swinging mechanical knives. Now, to return to our fictional spy from the beginning of the first chapter, this is 100% an obstacle it'd have to dodge through, avoiding the slicing blades while fist fighting some goon. But in real life, the knives simply slice the top of the eggs, allowing tubes to drop in and vacuuming up all of the virus laden egg white. That done, it's finally our turn to get revenge on the flu. After spinning the egg white at high speed to separate out any random particles, scientists then do to the virus what the Spanish flu did to humanity. They superkill it and then make sure it's dead by washing what's left with detergent. Technically, this is called inactivating and purifying the sample, but uh, we prefer to think of it as uh, payback. The process ends with scientists in possession of not the virus itself, but the antigen. The antigen is what spurs your immune system into action during an infection. After a vaccination, it triggers the same response, meaning your immune system will remember what to do when it encounters the actual virus in the wild. Given seasonal flu alone kills around 500,000 people globally each year, that's an important layer of protection. 
but it is not easy to make. The entire process from choosing the virus strains to administering the vaccines takes six months. And while in the US, the FDA authorizes two non-egg-based vaccines to fight the flu, with perhaps an additional mRNA one coming soon, around 80% of shots are still made in this way. That means that some 140 million doses annually are created from chicken eggs. In the case of a flu pandemic, that would be a good start, but still well below the amount needed to protect the entire population. Luckily though, any future influenza pandemic won't be the first one America's secret chicken farms have encountered. Unknown to most people, they've already had a dry run. One of the reasons people in early 2020 were pretty confident this whole COVID-19 thing would blow over is because uh, we'd already had several close calls. Aside from the avian flu scare in 2001, there had also been SARS and MERS. Each one, thankfully, was brought under control. But each one also lulled us into a false sense of security. And no case was more worrying, yet ultimately underwhelming, than that of swine flu. Now, if you're above a certain age, you're probably now thinking something like, oh yeah, swine flu. <laughs> Forgot about that one. And that's because swine flu blew up in 2009, causing huge panic that this was it. This was the big one, only to turn out to be, well, the great big flop. The virus equivalent of a much-hyped album by a beloved band that then falls flat. The Chinese democracy of pandemics, if you will. Behind the scenes, though, swine flu's failure had a huge advantage. It acted as the perfect practice run for mass flu vaccine production. During the 2009 to 2010 flu season, America's vaccine makers were hammering through eggs like a bodybuilder in the pre-steroid days. At the height of production, Sanofi was churning through 600,000 eggs a day. GlaxoSmithKline was using 800,000 every 24 hours. This was the production rate BADA had been planning for when they agreed to buy up unused vaccine doses in 2006. The sort of warp speed process that would keep America safe during a deadly pandemic. Sadly, when the real deadly pandemic hit in 2020, all of that training was for naught. Unlike influenza, coronaviruses can't be grown in eggs, so America's secret chicken farms spent the COVID-19 pandemic feeling as stark and useless as the rest of us. However, this doesn't mean the swine flu experience was a waste, because while coronaviruses were thought pre-2020 to be contenders for a pandemic, they weren't number one on most scientists' list of fears. No, that top spot went to our old friend influenza. And there are already warning signs that another flu pandemic may be on the horizon. After a decade or so defined by plague and war, you might think that the 2020s would be ready to give us a break. But, well, no, apparently not. Right now, in the spring of 2023, H5N1 avian influenza is sweeping through global bird populations, killing terrifying numbers of our feathered friends. Since it erupted in late 2020, this animal pandemic is thought to have killed over 150 million birds, and now it's starting to spread to mammals too. Recently, there have been cases of everything from sea lions to bears to dolphins falling ill uh, with H5N1. Worse, it's shown up on mink farms, where it's thought not just to be infecting mink who come into contact with birds, but those who come into contact with other mink. This is exceptionally bad news for any humans watching this, as the upper respiratory tract of mink is extremely similar to ours. As the aptly named bird flu specialist Thomas Peacock told the New York Times, the mink's upper respiratory tract is exceptionally well suited to act as a conduit to humans. Which means all it could take is for some mink farm worker already ill with regular flu to get infected, and we'll have yet another pandemic on our hands. It is a deeply depressing thought, having just emerged from two years of lockdown and misery. I mean, who could possibly stand another round? Luckily, though, this time we'll be far more prepared than in 2020. The moment a pandemic breaks out, the US government plans to transmit the variants involved to its secret chicken farms. Then the work will immediately begin on vaccine production. It'll be tough. An estimated 900,000 eggs will be needed a day, but it'll also be critical to ensure that the bird flu doesn't get into these farms and kill off most of the chicken stockpile. Thankfully, with strict biosafety measures already in place, that should not happen. And it also means that rather than the long wait we had with COVID-19, a bird flu vaccine should be ready to go within six months of an outbreak. It's a strange yet upbeat note to end this video on. The idea that right now there's a veritable army of poultry prepared to do enough intense mating and egg laying to save your life in a future pandemic. Hopefully, we won't ever need their services. But if the worst does indeed come to pass, it's somewhat comforting to know that we can rely on Uncle Sam's loyal birds 
to do their duty.